Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is the Flow Track Podcast. We're recording this on Wednesday, February 10th. I'm Kevin. He's Gordon. We have a lot of fast times to talk about today. You can email the show, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com, or check out our YouTube page. Also on the show, Gordon is going to give us a first look at the NCAA cross country rankings. Very excited about that. Gordon, how are you? Doing good. Crazy day yesterday. That's Much a crazy faster week. than I thought. Yeah, <laughs> much faster than I thought. It went one after the other after the other. It was like each event was in competition with the next event to do something more unbelievable. It was just like one-upsmanship. Um, and it's funny, they ended up ending the meet with the men's 60-meter hurdles where Grant Holloway broke his own American record, runs the second fastest time all time. And you would have thought going in, okay, that would have been the thing that we'd be leading off with. That would have been the main story of the meet. But what happened before that, and even the couple events prior to that, these distance races, Gordon, really, really uh, took off here. So, yeah, I guess you you were as surprised as I am, the vibe I'm getting at these times. Yeah. Uh, normally, I thought we were just going to get a typical, oh, uh, it's fast, but not crazy, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like... They they win a tactical race and it's you know it's a it's a, a respectable mark but I wasn't thinking all time marks and let's be honest Tim Hitt, Hutchings the play by play guy he was like flabbergasted after every race because he was like wait a minute no they're not they're yeah, not yeah. doing they're not running this fast because if you listen to his commentary he keeps on criticizing the Pacers a, a couple times and then mm-hmm. it turns out the Pacers were actually doing what they were supposed to do and getting them to a, a world record or top five all-time mark yeah well in the women's 1500 sagai knew what she was doing when you rewatch that race after you know the result and you see the two pacers go out so hard now granted they went out what 59 for the first 400 so they went a little probably faster than than she would have liked but that was very clearly a world record attempt just nobody knew maybe her coach knew maybe some other people around her knew but yeah, commentator certainly didn't know, and we didn't expect it. Three fifty three because it it looked like she was biting off more than she could chew. So I don't blame him for drawing that conclusion if he didn't know it going in that she's gonna she's gonna go break Genzebe de Baba's world record by a couple seconds. And he was speaking about it in the context of man, Laura Muir is like out of this. She's not gonna be able to come back. It's like no, no, no. nobody would have been able to come back because she's about to break the world record by two seconds. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and it's just it it just it just came out of left field. I mean, what was uh what's what was her PRs going into this race? I'm trying to bring her up. So she ju- she just turned 24. Um, I'm bringing up her stats, but I mean, outdoors she ran 354. So mm-hmm. it's, res- it's respectable, and she ran that in 2019. So when you dive into it, you kind of like, oh yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense a little bit. But, like, you just normally don't see someone being this fit, this ready to go early February when the Olympics are all the way in August. It just seems so random. It's just like, why? Mm-hmm. why what? You know, it, it, normally these types of things are, like, built up, you know, and everyone knows mm-hmm. about it. And there's, like, a three-week process where, like, hey, they're eyeing it. Monaco, that's the, that's the time, day, and place. Uh, but here, just, like, yeah, we're just going to do it indoor in February. Why not? It wasn't just – well, it was very debaba ish It reminded me of yeah. when she would go on those runs during indoor or Kajelka even a couple of years ago. But you're right. Those had a little bit more buildup. There would have been maybe a, a 1,000 or a 3,000 or something first. She did have a race under her belt this year, but nothing that would have suggested she'd run 353. When you look back at it, though – She's very overshadowed in the 1500. You mentioned the 354. That was when she got bronze behind Safan Hassan and Faith Kipigon in Doha. Two huge names. In the United States, in the 1500, we talk a lot about Shelby Houlihan and Jenny Simpson. Of course, Great Britain has a star there in Laura Muir. So she kind of got lost in the shuffle a bit here. And she obviously should not be, particularly um, if someone like Safan Hassan doesn't run the 1500 in in the olympics she's obviously now one of the one of the favorites but yeah just the timing just the timing but then if you go across the board here it wasn't just her running fast early 
So it wasn't just one person who happened to be in crazy shape. You go in the men's 1500, the men's 3000, the women's 3000. There are a lot of people who looked like the Olympics were going to be in three weeks in this meet. Yeah. What do you think a 353 indoors means for her moving forward? Like, what do you think, you know, people, I mean, I always remember when I was in college, Whenever you PR indoors, it's always a good sign because you're like, hey, mm -hmm. I'm always, you're going to be faster on the wider turns on the outdoor track. It was always a good sign for your future. What does a 353 indoors in your mind tell us? What telescope? What's, a, what's the telegraph? <laughs> Not telescope, telegraph. Telegraph for what she can be doing on the outdoor track. Yeah, I, I think it means we have multiple people who can break the 1500 meter world record because we already know Safan Hassan can do it because she ran 351 in a final in Doha. And then you're right, 353 indoors, you'd think she could go a little bit quicker outdoors. Although, although the lesson of BU teaches me that sometimes indoor tracks could be just as fast, if not faster, than outdoor tracks. And I don't know the exact composition, the angles of the banks at the Levan track, not as familiar with that as I am with the, the BU facility where a lot of people have run that and said, Hey, basically, right. People have said the BU tracks faster than an, than an outdoor track, especially because you can control for the weather. But yes, I think, I think 350 is certainly, certainly possible if she has the amount of opportunities, but something you've mentioned before is, Hey, the priority isn't going to be on fast times this year. Priority is going to be on getting Olympic gold. Maybe when people go outdoors, that's, close enough to the Olympics to where the focus shifts and we won't see this as much, but I just think we're getting to a critical mass here between her, between Hassan, between Shelby Houlihan too, who was right behind Sagai place wise in Doha of people who can drop a big one um, outdoors. So I think definitely Genzebe Dababa's mark is, is on the, uh, on the watch list here of overall records heading into the, into the outdoor season. I mean, think about, do you remember that indoor race a couple of years ago when Johnny Gregoric ran 359 and I think Sam Prakel ran like 350 point or something? And there was like everybody 349. 349. Yeah. 349. Prakel ran 350. There was like so many people who yeah. ran in that range. That was a Kajelka race leading the way. But so yeah, I mean, fast indoor times this early aren't shouldn't surprise us as much as they do, and yet they continue to do it for all the reasons that you mentioned. If you're Shelby Houlihan, does this scare you into the 5K? Does this what what's your reaction as you know an American uh, ti uh medal hopes, title hopes? You know, does she? Because obviously Shelby can she can choose if she's a 5K or 1500 meter mm -hmm. runner. She's going to make the Olympic team in either or, and she is going to be in contention in either or. I think she has to choose the one that she is definitely thinking that she has a better shot of being top three in. Does this performance change the percentages of what is the better event to potentially be a medal threat for someone like Shelby? I don't think it does. I think she's going to do the 15 still. That would be my guess right now. Now, if tomorrow Safan Hassan announces for some reason i am running the 1500 in the olympics as well too and all everybody says yeah i'm also running the 1500 then yes i can see here zig and zag over the 5000 but no no matter where you go you're going to get ridiculous competition correct i would love that to just see seems it. to be I'm, that i want to see an i am spartacus moment where it's like i am a 1500 <laughs> meter runner and they all just stand up i am a 1500 meter runner and then chubby's sort of like all right i'll do the 5k 5k yeah yeah but like, look at the 3K in this meet, right? You have Lem Lem Hailu, who most people did not have on their big board this year. Uh, 8.32 beats Safan Hassan, who runs 8.33. So no matter where you go, you're going to get crazy competition. I think when you have someone like Safan Hassan in 2019, it's advantageous to avoid her, right? But like, you don't know if she's going to be the same in 2021 and you don't know if there's going to be somebody or a collection of people who make it harder in another event so it's it's not as cut and dry i think as it was in 2019 i think heading into the 2019 championships we thought safana was a cut above now she ran the 15 
and the 10,000. So it was very difficult to, to sort of, to avoid her if you were in the distance races. But I just think it's tough to play that game because no matter what, you're going to have to run. I mean, you're going to need to be in what? You're going to need to be in like 352 shape probably at the Olympics to win a medal. That's what this tells me. And you know what else, Gordon? I mean, this is something uh, Lincoln and I were talking about before, like at the end of the year when we were just we were like forecasting out metal hopes. And Hassan went from the gun, right, which made that race even more difficult because you could say, all right, 1,500, it could get tactical. Shelby can take advantage because of her closing speed. But now with Sagai running 353, you probably have another person there who's going to be comfortable pushing it from the front as well, too. And I think the faster the race goes, the tougher it is for people with longer odds to get in the medals. So that's another thing to, to throw into the mix to consider as well. Yo, it's wild. Um, Halu was born in 2001. Man, we're getting yeah, old. She's... You look at these results, there's a lot of 2000s babies who are running <laughs> elite times in the world um yeah it's wild before mm -hmm. i was just thinking you know there's gonna be a moment when like 90 percent of professional sports are all 2000s babies and we're just gonna i mean i know mm -hmm. people who are 40 and 50 now have already dealt with this because they're like 90s babies what are those you know mm -hmm. but this is wild how so quickly young talent comes in and runs well right away i mean yeah sorry mm -hmm. i just noticed that i didn't mean no. to there were a I, lot I didn't of know, teenagers. i didn't know there were a I lot of teenagers Halo was 2001 damn yeah yeah okay so my takeaway though as well from that women's 3000 was safan asan she hasn't run an indoor race in a couple of years and you could tell she hadn't run an indoor yeah. race in a couple of years because she was so far back early on and I thought she's either real confident or she's forgotten that she needs to keep herself closer up. Now, the way Hailu closed with that kick, I don't think Hassan was beating her on that day. But she definitely had some, some tactical decisions early on in that race that made me think, okay, she needs to remember what it's like with these tight turns and how she needs to position herself. Because you can't – you don't see it that much – indoors the mo farah go immediately to the back the safan hassan strategy that you see outdoors of just like all right i'm gonna chill here in the back stay out of trouble and then go usually you see the people who are the favorites get right up on the rabbit shoulder early on so i think i'm willing to give hassan another couple races before saying that she's uh, lost some of her sheen I, I think she'll be fine i think she just needed to remember how to race indoors again yeah i i agree you i think you come out of that race with a very like, hey, she lost a, a I mean, it's quick, a, t a tactical race that she just wasn't prepared for, like you said. Kind of reminds me of like a regular season NBA loss for LeBron James. It's like, yeah, it can happen, but you know, when it comes down to a crunch time, he'll show up. And I think Hassan, mm -hmm. when it comes down to a crunch time, she'll show up. All right, let's talk about these men's distance races from this meet. Let's start first with that men's 1500. Jacob Ingerbritsen, 331.80, number five all time. Wins by five <laughs> seconds. I had to check the numbers there. Five seconds. Over Jacob five seconds. Just over a bit five over seconds. five seconds. Yeah, and look, I don't know the shape of the rest of the people. In the race, Bethel Bergen has run some indoor times that have been good this year. So he at least had shown form. There's a lot of other people. I don't really know what their plans were for this race. Like Samuel Tafara, who is the indoor world record holder. He was never a factor in this race. But Jacob Ingebrigtsen, I mean, talk about not missing a beat and talk about just continuing from one season to the next. The consistency of him at this young age just continues to be so impressive yeah it it was two races on that track i mean mm -hmm. it looked like a man among boys but the thing is he's the boy among the men <laughs> because <laughs> i mean the guy who got second was born in 1987 and he was mm -hmm. born in 2000 and i'll go back to, to time the dates but like that's just like crazy it's 13 years it's a whole yeah, yeah. 
that's a third grader, not third. That's a, a eighth grader between them, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I I think, man, it, it Jacob just keeps getting better and better. He looks smooth doing it, um, mm-hmm. and you just have to kind of think: Will he be able to break through when it matters most at mm-hmm. the global outdoor championship moment? We know he has the talent. We know he's shown the development. He has been through the ringer of different types of races. He's gone through Euros. He's gone through, you know, Doha. But 1500 is a hard race to win. And when there's mm-hmm. someone right now who who you thought who you think is going to break the world record in the 1500 who's currently in peak form, do you think Ingebrigtsen has any hope at gold, or do you think he mm-hmm. just has to wait his time and wait till twenty twenty four? I think his chances went up after yesterday. I'm more likely to see that upset now. I think it's it's so early, but part of this is just showing up and being in shape and being there and being able to capitalize on somebody else's either poor tactical decision or somebody else's off day. And if he keeps it up with these you know, 330 low, you know, performances or these, you know, he's always second and third in these diamond league races. If he keeps that up eventually in a championship, it's going to pay off for him. My question to you is this, this was his debut. He goes 331.80. The world record is 331.04 from Tefera. Is he going to be the first person under 331 indoors in the 1500? Yeah, in his post-race interview, he was talking about, like, you know, putting all of his focus on uh, the Olympics and training, training, training. But, like, hey, man, you just go go for a world record i mean there's only a few more indoor meets this season you can take a, a mini yeah. break right after but like it's if you just i think he should take a shot at it i think he should come back and like hey i mean if he goes out there and runs 333 then it's like all right shut it down get ready for outdoors but when you're that when you're licking a a world record you got to go for it i mean th- these three races the 15 the 3k and we'll talk about the 60 yeah. hurdles they're all like within spitting sh- chance of a world record. Go licking, for it. Licking distance. Licking, and licking chance. Distance. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. I mean, maybe he will. No, I'm I with mean, you. There's, a couple, there's a couple other I'm, 1500s probably on in, w- among the, within the world indoor tour. Why not? Mm-hmm. Can they ship the BU track over to Europe for the next couple of weeks? Is that a That's possibility? Yeah. Yeah. We should just have you, a, you want to. You want to see some crazy times? Do that. We should have a try meet of, at BU with Ingebrigtsen, Whale, and Holloway. We just run mm-hmm. those three races. We run them all at the same time, and then just boom. Yeah, we it's run the them all at the same time. To... S- speaking of doing things at the same time, I just got to get this off my chest. People are complaining about them cutting to um, the triple jump in the middle of the 1500. We we did visually miss like the breakaway that Ingebrigtsen made. No, we weren't doing the production. We, but the, here, here's it. But you know, it's on. It was on Flowcheck, but it wasn't like our production crew doing it. What are your thoughts on track producers feeling the need <laughs> to go to um, field events live and not recording it and then going to it? Hey, this just happened. I think it's a great time to use split screen if you have it. And I think, I feel like the dedicated field event feeds are something that's been used before, but do people like that? Like the field event people like it if they're just relegated to the second feed? I think they still like it. I think the problem is there are, I I think if you actually watch it, I guarantee you when they cut to the triple jumper, they thought he was about to go. Right, right. I right. bet you they thought it was only going to be a, like a 10 second break, like, oh, he's going, and then we're done. Yeah. But then the guy waited a little longer, and like, they're like, crap. I think they regretted going to him so early. I think they yeah. thought it would be a shorter, and I think the director's like, damn it, we're missing it. So I don't think the director was purposely being like, who cares about this race? <laughs> I mean, obviously, split screen and 
and <clears throat> two two feeds is always the ideal thing. But like production companies are all different all over the globe, and they're not all like trying to do the same thing. They're right. not all producing for the same type of platform. Like here, they're producing for an international feed that's like for one purpose to fit a TV window. They're not like <clears throat> thinking, "Hey, we are a uh, we have a a field of a uh, pole vault cam and this cam." They're yeah. they're thinking more yeah. TV world but yeah it was annoying i just i think to be honest i don't think it's a problem with tv i mean i'm gonna go out and say it why are events happening at the same time you don't have a slam dunk competition a three on three a three-point competition all happening at the same time of a five on five nba game you don't have you if if we want to take seriously if you, you should just play the sports at different times like and I know, like, oh, you can't do that because the sport would be forever. Well, then maybe that's a problem. Maybe you should have, if 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 you want if you want to grow the sport, maybe it should be a long jump. Uh, like we should long jump have hour. a long jump hour, and then have pole vault hour. And guess what? They'll be like, well, and if your response is like, yeah, but I won't be as exciting, then that's a problem. If you if you're gonna say that, if you're gonna say, well, like, well, you, it's only better when it's all together. Well. That means you don't think individually our our sports are valuable. That they're only valuable like a percentage. Like, I just think that we should separate sport uh, all the athletic events. I think it. I think if you want to do it right, you have this. Like my dream scenario for this for this meet is it, it's held over, like. Two day, uh, two two to three days. You have the field hour, then you have a sprint hour, and you have a distance hour. Mm -hmm. Boom. People can enjoy it, and then you realize, and then people will be like, "Hey, looks like the sprint hour is the most popular one. All right, we'll give that one prime time. Oh, looks mm -hmm. like the distance hour is the most popular. We'll give that one prime time. Anyway, just a thought when people complain about missing the, the break that Ingebrigtsen made. All right, back to the meet in any event. Okay, Sorry. <laughs> so good job. That was Gordon's uh, digression. Um, no, I think you bring up some points that are worth considering there for sure. It is more complicated, right? That's what yeah. I've learned doing this or being around this is it's always way more complicated than, than you think when you're just sitting at home to balance all those things because – you may like it one way, but then there's like six other people <laughs> who hate like that way there. and want to do yeah. it six different ways because they want to see this and you want to see that. And it is nuts because – so Mondo got hurt yesterday or pulled out of the competition, right? I don't think we have the full – the full, or at least I didn't hear the full story on the broadcast about what happened to him. But so you have that storyline going on. You had Zango, who is the triple jump world record holder, going. And then you have this insane distance – performances just back to back to back going on that's hard to do for anybody because you're right it's like three different four different things going on all at the same time uh you mentioned uh wale in that men's 3000 which was a insanely in, 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 like fun race to watch he goes 724 98 number two all time germa miscounts the laps because he was going for it on the second to last lap and then he crosses the line and then goes out to lane Two and then starts starts jogging. He still runs under seven thirty, which is crazy. I think you could any race where someone miscounts the laps, like and they're in it's a group, good. it just it makes the it makes the finishing time quicker. There's a direct correlation between those two things because everybody says, "Oh, well, I gotta go, I gotta go." Now it doesn't help the person who miscounts the laps. Usually they're in they're in a lot of trouble, but everybody following helps out. Anyway, this is a steepler who runs the second fastest indoor three thousand. Of all time, so we can invite him to this meet as well too, Gordon. Yes, with a B and if at we, BU. And what we'll do is to ensure that it's fast. We will, when we put the fields together for the three K and the fifteen hundred, we will the night before, uh, brainwash or we'll uh, what's what's the thing when you, uh, inception hypnotize. We'll hypnotize. We'll hypnotize the athletes the day before. Be Think that making them think that they're supposed to run one lap short, and then they just subconsciously do this, and then it leads to world records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay. how could you purpose? Could you, do you think you could pay 
maybe this is like a different type of pacing. Maybe it's called like the the anti pacer, where like you know you pay a pacer to run the first few laps at a certain pace, but maybe you need to start paying a closer. You pay the closer, and the closer is mm. like, all right, you need to r- stay in the pack, but with two laps to go, you need to pretend there's only one lap to go, and you need to push the pace. So you have a pacer to keep it going in the beginning, but then you have a, a closer. Hey, and I think that'd be tell, a new, that, and you don't you tell. You don't anyone. tell the star in the race that that's the yes. closer. They don't know. Yeah, yeah, they don't know. Well, this person's got to be pretty good. Yeah, because to hang at seven twenty five pace. <laughs> You need to be pretty good. So I don't know how many people are going to be raising their hands and saying, yes, I will run 90% of the race at world record pace and then sacrifice it all for somebody else to run the second fastest time in history. But I like that you've invented a new position, the running closer. It's good. The closer. Yeah. Hey, we have a closer and you have, you have a closer in baseball. You have the setup man in baseball. Mm-hmm. You have the starter in baseball. We just have the same mm-hmm. situation. You need the starter which is the, the pacemaker. Then you have the setup mm-hmm. man who pushes the pace in the middle. And then you have the closer who hammers a, a, a sub-60 mm-hmm. lap with a, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, be perfect. Well, we saw we saw in Vienna how good Eliud Kipchoge's bullpen was. He doesn't run 159-40 without that type of bullpen. Like, he had Ingebrigtsen yeah. as, as a yeah. middle reliever. He had, he had Centro. He had all sorts of people. He had Chalimo out there helping him. So if that's how good your support staff is, imagine how fast you can run. I this probably of all the results, this to me was the most surprising because yeah. that fast indoors hasn't happened in a very long time and Daniel Coleman's world records are somewhat sacred. They're a bit of running of running lower at this point and he almost he almost did it and he's a steepler. So uh, again, maybe you know, maybe this track is just ridiculously fat. Maybe Levin is the Boston of of France, and, and I'm unaware of it. But it makes me think that if some of these people keep racing during the winter months, we're going to see a bunch of records tumble. One more we got to talk about though, and that's your guy Grant Holloway, seven thirty two in the sixty meter hurdles, personal best, American record, and number two all time it showed up on the clock at 733 which would have been a tie i hate it when there's ties in all time marks so i like that it got rounded down to 732 very clean second best in history two 100s off the world record what do you think of grant's run um he is he oh, first of all what do you think of grant's look he shaves his head goes through that jordan mm. look and he he <laughs> he shaves his head he's you know Sticking his tongue out on the starting line, kind of like MJ when he's going for his dunk. I think he's been. I think he spent all pandemic, watch quarantine, watching the Last Dance and getting motivated. And now he's just going to go up and tear. You know, like I said, remember I said the coach told me we have a plan for indoor. I mean, his mm-hmm. plan was to become like just mm-hmm. to to really show like, hey, I'm no one's going to touch me in 2021. Mm-hmm. He, he beat. He'd be a good field by 0.2 seconds in a 60 meter yeah. type race. That is insane. I think he's going to go for it one more time. I think he has to. You don't fly all oh, the way yeah, to Europe yeah. and, yeah, he's going to try to break 730. I think he might do it. And I think he's going to have utmost confidence going in 2021. I think there's going to be a point. I mean, we're not there yet, but mm-hmm. it's not going to be about can Grant win anymore it's gonna be about grant chasing all-time marks history Um, yeah 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 history like yeah i'm sure he will never say that because like in his mind he's like well he doesn't he only has one medal right he's got to first start collecting some hardware before he can start um getting cute with his times and stuff but hey man start getting cute now let's do it yeah get get get, start running all-time marks yeah i've said this before i think he's gonna break the world record outdoors just a matter of when it's not a matter of if he's going to be the first person under 1280 in that race and a good start is going to be when he breaks breaks this world record you mentioned how big his margin of victory was and i noticed it and i know it's a prelim so you're saying kevin don't get carried away but just how quickly he put away 
the field in a 60 meter race was astonishing. I was on, I was messaging one of our social media people, Felicia, back and forth about the races as we were watching them. And I was just like, he's so much better than everybody. This is ridiculous. And she said, should I tweet that? I said, well, no, don't, you don't need to tweet that. I'm just telling you that. Like the, you should not do that in a prelim, right? Like in a prelim, yeah. it was over after a hurdle and a half. It was just ridiculous how much better he was. And then you mentioned, yeah, two tenths of a margin in the final. There were some really good hurdlers in that race. 110 outdoors, a little bit of a different story. I'm not handing him the gold medal yet, but we're starting to see it, it all come together for Grant Holloway. And what's going to happen, Gordon, I think, is the international scene is going to start looking like the NCAA scene for Grant Holloway, mm. where, he, where he just has that level of consistency. And it's going to take someone like a Daniel Roberts – having the season of their life to contend with him. I'm not saying he's going to have a career where he's never going to get pushed and never going to get challenged because he certainly had that in the NCAA, but we're going to get into the default setting where Grant Holloway goes into every race, every championship as, as the favorite. I think that's where we're headed. Didn't Grant look like he was like, this is a compliment. For, so if Grant's listening, don't take it. Take it. <laughs> Did he look like he was like thirty? Like well, it wasn't that long ago. The haircut, the haircut. I think he got he stronger, like stronger, man. His, I know okay. he always had like broad shoulders, but he definitely. I feel like he has put on a few pounds of muscle since we last saw him. He did not look mm -hmm. like he was not. He looked like a line, like a. I mean, I don't, if you can call it a skinny linebacker, if that's a thing, but that's what he looked like. Looked like a, mm -hmm. a lanky linebacker. Maybe I, I'm. Did you notice that? Like, has a, a kind of a body transformation for him since we last saw him? I I didn't. Uh, that didn't jump out to me. I maybe I was just focused more on uh, the new haircut, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, what about also the effect of you're going from running four events to now running one event where you can focus yeah. on it all the time? There's just all these reasons to think he's going to get better and better once you pull all that together and you have the time to really really refined i mean you went out you've seen a couple of his workouts like he spent yeah. a good amount of time right doing other events and and i think that ultimately that's going to pay off for him because then it makes him an all-around athlete which is going to contribute to his longevity uh as a as, as a pro and it certainly helps i mean when you're running when you're splitting 43s on four by fours that's useful strength to draw on throughout the length of a professional hurdle season as well yeah for sure all right well, leave, that's our leave-in recap. So what we're going to do here, we're going to unveil exclusively for the first time ever Gordon's NCAA 2021 rankings. We're going to do that. We're going to read some YouTube comments. Uh, but first, we're going to go to our first in a series, uh, the Under Armour Performance Series, an interview here with Michael Watts, sports scientist and Olympic champion, Natasha Hastings, when we come back, Gordon will reveal those NCAA cross-country rankings. And now it's time for the Under Armour Performance Series. Under Armour is more than an apparel or shoe company. They're a human performance company trying to not only make their athletes better, but everyone a better runner in this series. We're going to talk to several athletes, coaches, and trainers on a variety of topics to help improve you as a runner from preparation, nutrition, and training to competing and recovery. Today's guests are Olympic champion Natasha Hastings and Michael Watts, the director of global athlete performance at Under Armour. Start first with you, Michael. We've heard a lot about this human performance center that Under Armour has in Portland. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, yeah, so um, Under Armour um, are pretty unique in the fact that we have this performance center that's based out in Portland, Oregon. And really what the, the brief was, was to build a world-class center that could help train, recover, assess athletes, either on a, an hours basis, or we've had athletes that have come and stay with us for up to two weeks. And when, when the vision was painted out by the, the vice president of, of um, human performance, uh, Paul Winsper, who, who, who really had this huge vision to build this, this center, that was the brief put in place. And then it was really 
between Paul and I to go and have a, a ton of fun to build this thing that was probably unconventional in terms of we were trying to break the mold and we were trying to do something different in the space and, and not just follow the the norm so to speak so through through our research and through our education and through our contacts and through this really pursuit of of performance and, and human performance as a holistic measure we we feel that we've created something that we're really proud of as a brand um love to host athletes and coaches and teams and and it, it and it just sort of grows and builds and we get the opportunity to have a, a lot of fun in that space that's for sure what is your approach to optimizing human performance um i think where we come at it slightly differently is that if, if you take performance as a as a segment of, of, of being an athlete it's usually not that healthy for the for the individual and it's always performance at a cost and i think what we believe and what paul and i wanted to build was how could we promote performance at the highest highest level but without the cost and how could we start to look at the bigger picture how could we look at the mind and how could we look at the body and how could we look at how that presents itself and, and, and really helps the athlete perform the best at their craft but start looking at things like sleep or light or circadian rhythms or breath work or nutrition in a different way and not be so concerned with how high or how fast somebody can run in a test but be interested in how do they move like how do they think what do they eat like how their brain works um how they periodize their training do they take time for recovery what recovery modalities do they use so really try to look at it differently and, and really bring this evidence-based approach to our to our athletes and say hey like if if you feel we can help you and you feel that there's an area that you're interested in then we'll we'll be there to support you and be an extension of your team is there anything uh like a specific example of how an athlete in this program uh, changes their competition or makes a change to the way they recover or change the way they do their workouts? Like, what's like the difference between with this and without it? Yeah, we, th there's been numerous examples. Obviously, we, we've, we're lucky that we've got Natasha here with us. And we, we've had Natasha a couple of times, I think, in Portland. And I've been down to Austin as well. And we've looked at movement efficiency with Natasha and we're talking about the minutia of something going on in Natasha's kinetic chain where she can see, okay, if I can align that and become more efficient in my movement, that's going to help me when I come out of the blocks and in, in, in my start, or it might be down to a really individual project. And, and maybe we'll go into more detail on this one where we might be researching something where there's not a lot of evidence that exists. So, with Natasha and through her pregnancy, we really wanted to understand the female athlete and we wanted to just inform Natasha to say, hey, this is maybe what you can expect. This is what the research says. This is things that you can do to help mitigate or, or accelerate your recovery and really be this applied um, thought leader for our athletes to say, we're gonna look at the research, we're gonna apply it in a manner that works for you and we'll do everything we can to, to to make sure that it fits within your journey. Natasha, can you can you speak to that a little bit more? What's been your experience working with the human performance team throughout uh, your time there? Yeah, I was going to say it's more of an addition to and collaboration than making changes. I think the approach kind of feels like your coaches know what they're doing. We're not here to change what they're doing. We're here to assist what they're doing. So everything from like how you're sleeping, your nutrition, how can you be more efficient in your exercises? What are some exercises that you could be doing to train those smaller muscles? Um, it's really been more of that approach that I think has been beneficial and really, um, I think working from what I feel like is a model of like, if the athletes are better then the brands better and vice versa um you know going out there i think i've been out to portland 
maybe three or four times. And as Mikey said, he came out to Austin once. Um, just even the energy of being there where it's like everyone's eager to learn, eager to find out what it is that we can do to make, you know, the athlete better. And I mean, we all know at this level, it's like this little <laughs> one small thing that makes this huge difference. So that attention to detail and really, you know, paying attention to what the minor changes are that make that much of a difference. You've had a very long and very successful career. How important is it for you to feel like you have a brand that's committed to making you better with this level of detail? Yeah, coach and I actually had a brief conversation about how long my career has been <laughs> this morning. <laughs> um, and I do think there there's a, a few things that I credit to having such a long career is um, understanding the importance of training just right. And I think, again, um, you know, Paul and Mike coming from the perspective of rest and recovery rather than more work and uh, working more efficiently as opposed to doing more IE overtraining. Um, that to me has honestly been um, the key ingredient to preserving my career and being in the game for so long. Um, being able to say, hey, I need rest or, hey, I have to listen to my body here. Something's not right. How do we take a step back and fix this and not be so um, so far in the, the hole, if you will? And then the other thing, I know I'm speaking to <laughs> men here, but um, my experience at Under Armour has been one where um, I guess the women are the gatekeepers. And I want to like to speak to was when I made the phone call that, hey, I'm pregnant, I'm still going forward with things, but obviously this puts things on hold, you know, making the call to a female and someone that on the other side of the line understood um, what it was that I was going through, but then also having the same passion from Paul and Mike, where it's like, we not only want to understand the athlete, but we want to understand the female athlete and what it takes to be elite as a woman. Um, so again, that attention to detail and that attention to the little but big things that make the big difference. Um, I think all of those things added, compounded, have contributed to my longevity in the sport. Michael mentioned, uh, you know, looking at all the details of rest, uh, the, the light in your room, and mentioned how you kind of will approach uh, a pregnancy and how to train post-pregnancy. Post Have you noticed anything different about going through this process with this performance center, like kind of helping you as opposed to just being, they're not just a logo on your shoe or a logo on your kit. They're like trying to find that, like you said, that minute detail. Um, and with something with like pregnancy, that's a huge detail to be able to get through that and be able to come out even better than you were before or at the same level and like you haven't lost the beat? Um, yes. And largely from the mental aspect of it, because being a professional athlete in itself is a tremendously um, tough <laughs> situation to be in when, you know, you're expected to perform. Um, and I've been in situations where, you know, you're expected to perform, go do your job, and that's just that. Um, having a brand that makes the investment that not only are we going you know, support you in representing our brand, but whatever we can do to help you to be the best athlete that you can be, we're also going to make that investment as well. Um, and it does something mentally to know that, you know, you have, you can trust your brand to help you. And, and I know that when I make the phone call, the worst that they could say is no, but 95% of the time, they're going to figure out a way to try to help me out and figure out like, okay, well, we can get some time out in Portland. I can get you on the phone with Paul or Mike. We can figure this out. Um, I think it definitely, if you can be in a good mental state, then obviously you can go out and train more efficiently and then of course go out and perform um, at a higher level. So it's, it may be some of the things that, as much as it helps physically, 
knowing that you have this backing and this support makes the difference in your output. Olympic champion Natasha Hastings and Michael Watts, the director of global athlete performance at Under Armour. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Under Armour Performance Series. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, I think you're muted. We are back. Cross country rankings time. Gordon, I'm just going to go with the headline here. Really surprising NAU not in the top 10 for the men. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, well, go ahead. Let's, 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 what should we start with, the men or the women? Women. Let's go with the women first. Women? Start with the women first. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk about individuals first i, I want to talk about individuals Let's start with individual women first mm -hmm. this is your yeah. you know black canvas here blank canvas do this as you is, will this is my this is my canvas okay so one thing i wanted to do was let's just kind of see where we are right now hold on so we came out with rankings back all the way in august crazy i still created rankings back in august and then we had a weird season called the COVID season where only like a third of the teams are racing um, they were all mm -hmm. building up towards a conference championship. And we created this COVID era ranking where it was all based off literally what these kids did in the two months of racing that they had in these small meets. Um, mm -hmm. But those rankings are now irrelevant because now we have the actual, all the teams together. And so what I want to do was I wanted to figure out uh, basically where we stand today based off of the data points that we are given and these data points that we have, we have three data points for every athlete up to three. And those three data points are data point one, how they finish at the 2019 NCAA cross country championships. Data point two is how they fared on the track since that championship. So basically indoor five K's and three K's in 2020, um, any five K's are, that they were run randomly in the summer of 2020 and then current 2021 indoor uh, marks, right? And then the, th the third data point is these, I call it regular season cross country meets, whether it's, you know, this silver state challenge where NAU and BYU race each other, or it's the big 10 championship or the big 12 championship back in October. So those are our three data points. You have 2019 XC, 2020 XC, and 2020 slash 2021 track. And so I take those three data points. I weight them differently. Not everyone has all three. Some people didn't run 2019. Some people don't have a track time. I weight them all. I create this algorithm. I put it in a computer system and boom, we get these rankings. Now I also kind of change it a bit. I might sub subjectively, hey, I'm going to bump you up because I like you or bump you down because I don't like you. But that's where we are at. And so basically we have a whole new top 25 individuals, whole new top 25 teams. We rank the top 50 individuals, 250. So if you want to see mm -hmm. who I have projected to finish a hundredth, a hundredth, a hundredth, is that the right word? A hundredth? Yeah, that's the right word. Mm -hmm. Hundredth is a weird word to say. Hundredth, one hundredth. Anyway, uh, we have those all on the site. So let's just talk a little bit about the top 10 I have now for women individually. In 10th, I have Tyler Beeling of Boise State. She's a she ran well at the Nevada meet. I think she was top five there. But she she's a she's a international transfer. She hasn't run in the NCA, so she might be a low key uh, next great star for Boise State. She came out of the gate well. So Tyler Beeling, I have tenth. Taylor Rowe of Oklahoma State, I have ninth. She was the one who finished runner up to Whitney Orton back in the Oklahoma State invite. Melanie Smart, the sophomore from Washington, I have eighth. Seventh, I have Joyce Camelli of Auburn. Sixth, I have Anna Camp of BYU. Kind of teasing what we're going to talk about, the BYU women's team. Uh, fifth, I have Kaylee Logue of Iowa State. Fourth, Bethany Haas of Minnesota. Third, fan favorite, Mercy Chilanga of Alabama. Second, Ella Donahue of Stanford. And first, Whitney Orton of BYU. 
Orton, I think, is a heavy favorite here of BYU, and then everyone's chasing her. Um, but yeah, new names there in that top 10. You know, no one was really talking about Anna Camp of BYU, um, Tyler Beeling of Boise State, Taylor Rowe of Oklahoma State, mm -hmm. newer names to that top 10. So that's what we have individually. What are your thoughts on the individual battle that we have on the women's side? I agree that Orton is the heavy favorite. I am surprised by how many names here people probably aren't familiar with or wouldn't think are top 10. Now, part of that is because you've dropped some other people who have had some bad races, but part of it is we've just talked about, about it. It's just a transitional season for many reasons uh, on the women's side of things. We talked about it impacting the distance races indoors as well too. So there's going to be a lot of people who made huge jump up jumps up from the last time we had a cross country championship to now um that's those were my first my, my my first thoughts my i guess my bigger thoughts come into play as it pertains to the team race here because there's some people you have pretty low particularly from a certain team that i think is weighing that team down that let's just say they have room for growth i'll just say yeah that in your rankings agreed uh the top freshman i have ranked right now is ranked uh, I believe 19th. Is that correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. 19th. Zofia Dudek. She's mm -hmm. a freshman out of Stanford. She ran well at the FSU Classic meet a few a weekend ago. Um, so yeah, right now, top freshman isn't Caitlin Tui. We haven't seen her. Uh, Zofia Dudek yeah. of Stanford. Um, which would be someone that Stanford's gonna need to rely on because we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about the team battle. But yeah. Top freshman, Dudek in 19th. I think the next freshman I have is all the way down in 45th place, and that is Sasha Nagila of North Carolina. So, In general, you can just already tell from – well, not even – you don't have a, a team with a whole bunch of runners in the top 10 themselves. So you can tell this is going to be – you're projecting a high team score this year for the winner. Yes, and – We'll go into the, the team on the women's side. So uh, we'll start at – I'll just check do the whole thing. So 25, Iowa State – no, <laughs> excuse me. Ohio 25, State. Ohio State, 24, Southern Utah, 23, Iowa State, 22, Indiana, 21, Kentucky, 20, Ole Miss, 19, Illinois, 18, Notre Dame, 17, North Carolina, 16, Oklahoma State, 15, New Mexico. We'll get back to that later. 14, Michigan State, 13, Georgia Tech, 12, Minnesota, Duke, 11th, Florida State, 10th, NAU, 9th. Big, that's, who would have thought? The women's team now, top 10 program. Uh, NAU, 9th, mm -hmm. Boise State, 8th, Colorado, 7th, Alabama, 6th, led by Mercy Chilanga, Arkansas, 5th. Mm -hmm. Hey, maybe they could win both. Indoor Double. Who would have thought? <laughs> Double. Uh, Stanford fourth, NC State third, Washington second, and BYU one. So Washington and wow. BYU I put in the one-two spot ahead of North Carolina State and ahead of Stanford. What are your, th I guess, what are your thoughts on these rankings that we have now? Okay, so we should say NC State, that does not include Tui, which – in a Correct. forecast this tight and with a winning score that you're projecting this high could be massively important, will be massively important. Then we get to Stanford, where you have Lawson, I think, projected somewhere in the 40s, and you have Aubrey Roberts somewhere in the 100s. I don't think that holds. So I think the team that has the most room for growth here in these rankings of that top tier is definitely Stanford. BYU is interesting. Okay, they have Orton, obviously, that solid number one stick. Anna Camp ran really well. You have her sixth in the nation. Might be a bit ambitious, but I looked at how you charted. I went into the 250, Gordon, because everybody yeah. should dig into the 250. Don't just do the top 25. Like, figure out who's 174th, <laughs> too. And you have BYU's fifth in the hundreds. So there's certainly, so you might say, okay, their number two isn't going to be top 10, which there's a good likelihood that, that she won't. But they could make that point those points up somewhere else. Is it unrealistic that yeah. BYU's fifth is in the 80s, in the 70s? Certainly not. They definitely could pack everybody in to the top 100 and then drop some points there too. I see this – I think you're being way too harsh on New Mexico too, but I'll let you explain. 
Yeah. I see this. I think those those four teams: BYU, Washington, North Carolina State, Stanford. I would put in a tier alone, and I actually would throw in Colorado to that tier. And the reason I would throw in Colorado to that tier is they just have a ton of experience when you look at the transfers that they bring in, and I think you're going to see them improve and come on really strong this last six weeks of the season because experience is going to start to pay off. So they have people like Abby Nichols from Ohio state, Michaela DeGenero of Michigan, Rachel MacArthur, right? All these transfers who have run in a lot of big time races, you mix them in there with all the other pieces that they have with Mark Whitmore and Heather Burroughs. So I, I see this as a five team race right now. And I don't know. I would not have had BYU number one, but it's so close and there's so many question marks still. You had to pick somebody. Yeah. And right now, this is going to be a high scoring, like you said, it's going to be a high scoring team when um, I right now have BYU winning it with 138 points. For perspective, BYU got second with 108 points last year. Mm-hmm. So I have them get it being worse this year, but winning, you know? So, and I think it's just, a, it's a, the entire field has kind of been diluted. You see New Mexico lose Wayne Kalati. You see this, uh, NC state's freshman, not really seen much, right? Caitlin Tui is yet to run in the NC state uniform and she's had multiple opportunities. She had all fall cross country, NC State women have been running some indoor 5Ks and 3Ks, and she hasn't been in any of them. I think that is a sign of, like, what are you holding her out for? If you're not going to run her now, when are you going to run her? Uh, That's why I had to look at NC State a little bit different and be like, all right, maybe they're not going to be that three freshman up front type team. Maybe they're going to hold out some of them, and they're not perfectly healthy, and they have a lot of depth. And just, like, in Stanford – we were expecting that. I know we talked about this. The one-two punch of Donahue and Lawson. Lawson didn't look good in the FSU Classic. And I had to start. I can't only wait. Hey, well, if you did well in 2019 cross, you're going to do well in 2021 yeah. cross. I had to start giving people credit and lose credit based off what they've done on the cross-country course in the past few months. Now, I think this upcoming weekend or two weekends from now, Stanford, Colorado, and New Mexico are going to race in Nevada. And I think that will change these rankings. I think if one of those teams has a great race, I could see them increasing their stock and being ahead of BYU, especially a team like New Mexico, which we have ranked 15th. They're ranked 15th because a lot of their athletes haven't done much in a long time. They're all mm-hmm. based off of 2019 marks. And I was like, hey, I can't really talk about 2019 track right now in 2021. I do think New Mexico is going to probably show up at Nevada and win it with the with, with like three new names in their top five. And then when I add mm-hmm. those three new names, they're going to go from 15th to like a top three team. I think that's going to happen. Okay, so you, think there's, then, so you think there's you think there's like six teams that could win this thing then? Yeah, I do, I do think – okay. I'm just waiting for New Mexico to do something. They haven't done anything. They haven't run in a long, long yeah. time. And I just can't – I am I, I, stopped doing like, oh, I just know you're going to be good. I took that all out. No more. I know mm-hmm. you're going to be good. It's all about literally I need results. And New Mexico hasn't given me a result right now. They will in two weeks. And then most likely I think mm-hmm. if it's good, they'll they'll bump into the top four, five. Um, yeah, you look at the roster. They have a lot of – pieces there they have a lot of people who would be like a championship teams you know fourth or fifth runner on their team right they don't obviously don't have Kaladi, and we don't know about all the other people that they brought in who we don't have much info on but someone like ad cohen is a good runner is a good runner and she's yeah. an important part of a of a of a podium team maybe even a like, championship team okay they have they have a freshman from norway that i just looked on the sketch on the roster who hasn't run an NCA? I mean, she ran a 923K. And I was like, that's pretty good. But I was like, I can't, I'm not gonna like start thinking about your random international athletes until they actually put a result on the paper. And mm-hmm. so that's what I have to do with okay. New Mexico. Well, we only need to wait so, yeah. about a week. 
We only need yeah, about a we only have to wait about, wait about a week for them. But, and I'm assuming big Washington's going to run. Big shout out to Alabama. Big shout out to Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm do you really want to do the men? That. Yeah, let's do the men. So yeah, let's do it. Um, top ten. Morgan Beetlescum, I have tenth. Michigan State. Now he might eventually just. I have a feeling he might not even be at this meet. He didn't run a big tens. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was a COVID reason. And he did run like a, a slower 3K, I think. But Beagles, Beatles Scum is good. He's run like 13, 35 or something like that. He's good. Mm -hmm. He's run well at NCAAs. I have him 10th. Ninth, I have Stan Neeston of Portland. He is an international transfer. He's a 13, 30 guy. Um, he, won he got second in the Portland versus Oregon dual meet. Um, so he's mm -hmm. good. Eighth, I have Yared Nagus. Seventh, I have Edward Herrera of Colorado. Sixth, I have Nico Young, freshman, NAU. Preseason, I had 19th. I have 19th okay. preseason. Now he's all the way up to six. Fifth, I have Amoyne okay. Kemboy of Arkansas. Fourth, Wesley Kiptu of Iowa State. Third, Cooper Tier, Oregon. Second, Connor Mance, BYU. And first, Luis Carhalva, NAU. So my top Basically, my f top five now were all in my top six in preseason. So yeah, I don't think there's anything too crazy here, other yeah. than Isai Rodriguez being down in 18th. But I mean, I mean, there's the difference between fifth and 18th is going to be a matter of probably seconds. <laughs> so yeah. I don't think that that's that un unrealistic. And he got beat but well he had to race against some good people now that I think about it in the fall right he raced kip yeah. two and he raced Grijalva. so yeah and I mean, he could have just yeah, yeah he Herrera. could have run in yeah he could have run against easier competition and racked up wins and you probably would have been higher so i think he has if you want to buy buy low on somebody buy low on isai rodriguez right now at, yeah at and, 18th. and i put nico young there in sixth i mean he has proven that he yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's I think that's fair. Yeah, I think it's wild to, too. It's time. like, but the only thing that's kind of wild that true freshman that we think is going to finish in the top ten that doesn't happen that often. No, because some people on this show said he's going to be sub thirteen thirty and potentially break German Fernandez's American Junior record in the spring. So no, it's not. It's, it's all going according to plan for the people who uh, okay. understand the development of Nico Young. Can I read the top twenty five for the teams? Yeah, hold on. Uh, I'll talk about the second freshman I have is currently ranked mm. 46th. Stanford's Cole Sprout. So I have him 46th. What about uh, and is, is Hawker not a freshman? Hawker's a sophomore. I thought he was a freshman, oh. but he's a sophomore. Yeah. And then okay. the next freshman is from Wisconsin. Rowan yep. Ellenberg. I have 54th. Hey, low key, Wisconsin. Pretty good. Anyway, well, teams. yeah, we're we're gonna need to talk about Wisconsin here in a second because okay. here's what we Let's I'll I'll get to in a second. So, uh, twenty five Weber State, twenty four Air Force, twenty three Furman, twenty two Ole Miss, twenty one Purdue, twenty Michigan, nineteen Michigan State, eighteen Virginia, seventeen Portland, sixteen Colorado, fifteen Oklahoma State, fourteen Stanford, thirteen Washington, twelve Iowa State, eleven Wake Forest, ten NC State, nine Tulsa, eight Oregon, seven Iona, six Indiana, five Notre Dame. Four Arkansas, three Wisconsin, two BYU, and one NAU. So first, let's just talk about NAU BYU, and then we'll talk about the rest. Hey, do we need to There's talk about a, that again? Can we on, do a whole I, podcast I talk about, about are you yelling about this? I got to talk about for fifteen. Give me ten seconds. Ten seconds. Start okay, right go, now. Go, go. It is oh. not a dual meet right now between NAU BYU. NAU is much better than BYU, in my opinion, based off You've of scoring. This. I know, but like BYU isn't isn't racing NAU. BYU is is racing Wisconsin, Arkansas, Notre Dame, and company for second, in my opinion. I think there's a clear gap. Last year, the, the gap was after two. Right. I feel like here, the gap is after one. All right, that's my NAU-BYU take of the day, brought to you by People Gordon. People didn't know Man. that. <laughs> All right, anyway. Yeah, okay, so... <laughs> Poke, poke holes in these rankings. Go for it. And I will come back at you with numbers. Well, I think you're wrong about that, but I've already expressed my feelings about the, the NAU-BYU okay. gap. Uh, Wisconsin, I guess you're waiting the Big Ten championships immensely high. I thought you said Arkansas had a chance at the title, and now you have them below Wisconsin. Okay, so 
I sent to you. Let me bring this up. Where, 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 where are we? Where are we? Right here. Okay. So this is how I have the scoring coming out. You sure you want to report this? All right. No, you don't. No. You want to say the scoring? No, okay. no I don't. Okay. No, I don't want to say the scoring. Okay. All right. We already so know there's a gap. There, there's a gap. But basically, we understand. I have BYU, Wisconsin, Arkansas all scoring about 200 points. And they're all separated by a few points. So, gotcha. Okay. BYU but, like, gets how did Wisconsin non- do this? So, okay. How did Wisconsin, Wisconsin do they this? Have, okay. I have – they have sophomore Jack Maher, who I have getting 30 points. Charlie Wheeler, a junior, 31. Then they have Rowan Ellenberg, freshman, 44. Olin Hacker, senior, 45. Bob Liking, freshman, 55. Jackson Sharp, sophomore, 59. Evan Bishop, freshman, 64. And – they have another guy, Shwab uh, uh, Ashabali, who I don't Ajibale. have here, who I don't have ranked, but most likely will probably be in their top five. He's not ranked because he didn't run Big Tens. He hasn't run many track races, so he just has no data points. So we can't really put him in there. You have nobody. You have nobody from Wisconsin in the top twenty-five. Doesn't matter. They are packed. Yeah, you have. They're going to be third. okay. They're going to be so okay. packed in the 30s to 50s. They're just going to be like, boom, we're, we're podium. Like they don't need, they're not going to have like the low stick. And then their, their, their seventh man is going to be better than everyone's like fifth. It's just their first man is going to be also worse than everyone's third, but they're just going to be right there packed up. And I think on a good day, they're going to get second or third. And on a bad day, they're getting eighth. Like that's just how it's going to come and i come out they have we they're they're re they basically have re retold jack mayher ran 1344 uh jackson sharp has run 1344 olin hacker is a legit like guy cross-country guy they have some some guys and all right so you're saying that they won big tens without without jack meyer like without their number one stick you're saying here – also, Bob Liking has to be on the all-name team. I just want to say that yes. right now. Yes. Got it. You're saying that you have BYU in Tier 1 and then in Tier 2 – or sorry, NAU in Tier 1. And then you have BYU – is it Wisconsin and Arkansas in Tier 2 before Notre Dame? Or is Notre Dame in that same tier? You could put Notre Dame in the same tier. But – Because BYU, yeah. BYU looked – Better than Notre Dame by a comfortable margin, I thought in the first, you know, in the in the Nevada. Yeah. Now I again, think the, it's, I think it's Notre early. Dame had a, a a bad day that day, but you know, yeah. I, Where does that tier end? Let me just ask it that way. Where does that tier end? How many people or how many teams are in tier two? So in tier two right now, I would say there's four teams: Arkansas, Wisconsin, BYU, and Notre Dame. But okay. I reserve the right to add teams to this tier before the championship <laughs> because most likely I will. I will probably add teams to this tier because I think teams like Portland, Colorado um, mm. have a chance to prove themselves. Not not Colorado. Portland, Stanford. Yeah. I think teams like Portland, Stanford. Yeah. And Oregon I'm buying, have a chance I'm, have a chance to prove themselves to be in tier two because they have the Pac-12 championship and the West Coast Conference Championship. So I'm buying like Portland, Portland runs well in, against BYU. Sorry. Yeah, you have me down. You have them down in 17th. I'm buying Portland, yeah. and I'm also buying Iowa State. You have them way down in 12th. I'm buying Iowa State as well too. Two two teams I'm buying right now. You can buy. Well, yeah. Well, I'm buying. You know, I'm selling. I'm selling I'm NAU. Because you think they're going to score 15 points. Selling NAU. I'm, I'm buying Wisconsin in the actual market because no one is talking about Wisconsin. The coaches poll is not going to rank Wisconsin well. They're 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 good. Like, they're right. gonna well, maybe you shouldn't have you shouldn't have ranked them yet. Then you should have bought them. No, first I, and then done no, the rankings. I'm, I'm, so. I'm going to rank them how they deserve to be ranked. I do think Portland's going to. I think Portland and New Mexico on the women's side, Portland on the men's side, they're both teams who I think will be ranked in the top six right before the championship. But right now, they just don't have data yeah. points, so they're not ranked there. But I'm telling you, Wisconsin. Also, Tulsa. Loki is good. Don't dude. sleep on Tulsa. Don't sleep on Tulsa. Tulsa, 
Tulsa's good, but they have they have two good guys. Their fifth is just like their fifth looks good in small meets like a conference mm-hmm. championship. But when you throw their fifth in a field of 256, their fifth is not going to be getting 60th. It's going to most likely be getting 120th. And that just okay. separates you from being a top three to, you know, top. They're still going to be top 10. They're still a good team. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Those are the rankings. So you can email Gordon, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com or comment on YouTube and tell him why he's wrong. Speaking of YouTube comments, we were going to read them today, but unfortunately we're out of time. So we'll do that on Friday. We'll have time on Friday to do that when we preview all the action of the weekend, like the Iowa State Classic and the New Balance Indoor Grand Prix, which is in New York this year. So plenty of stuff to discuss on, on Friday. I think that's it. Is there anything else you want to add on the rankings? Uh, check them out on the site, top 250. Um, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited actually for the next few weeks. We're going to basically release rankings every week. This week was cross country. Next week, we'll update indoor. Then we'll update cross. We'll go back and forth until we crown a champion. But uh, I'm very, I, I really, I, I really think I, these rankings are showing something that no one else is seeing. You know, they're showing. Mm-hmm. That Wisconsin is good. They're showing that BYU women are good. They're showing that Alabama women are good. They're showing that like Stanford men and Iowa State men are a little bit overrated. They're showing, you know, I just think there's they're showing like a team like Wake Forest. I have Wake Forest eleventh on the men's side. We should talk about Wake Forest. Like, all right, Alon, start playing the wrap up music. I wanted Gordon to give like you. one final Look thought. Out. Now he's just Jack talking about Tiernan, how great his rankings Tiernan's are. Brothers on the team. Play the music. Play the music. Let's get out of here. Gordon's going to talk about every single team in the next episode. Thank you to Alon for producing. We'll talk to you guys on Friday. Shout out Tim Duncan.